Welcome to World 101X, the Anthropology of Current World Issues. We're here at the AAA conference in Minneapolis um, on the very last day, and we have the real pleasure to be joined by Donna Austin. Welcome, Donna. Thank you for having me here. It's a oh, pleasure. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Donna is a PhD candidate at Rutgers University. Correct. Um, so I guess it'd be great to start by with a question that we ask many of the interviewees that we meet here, um, which is just to tell us about how, tell us about your journey into anthropology. So how it was that you discovered anthropology as a field of study, what it was that attracted you to it. Um, yeah, just your yeah, personal connection with it. So I think, for, so for me, um, my undergraduate background is in uh, Africana studies and linguistics. Um, and many of the issues and uh, and subjects that are of interest to me, uh, issues dealing with race, race and language, um, you know, race and politics, race and, you know, there's, you know, there's, I have, I have a consistent interest in issues of race and inequality. Um, and I think for me, um, coming from a field uh, such as Africana studies, which is by nature interdisciplinary, um, and there's a lot of different types of methodologies and, and, and types of knowledges that, uh, that you draw upon, history, political science, economics, uh, whatnot. Um, anthropology seemed like a reasonable fit method methodologically because it's a field where I can talk about and analyze and study uh, contemporary uh, contemporary people and their cultures and their lives and, and their behaviors, um, but using all uh, a variety of different tools, right, to um, to kind of come to an analysis. So I think for me, it was it was the way to kind of take that interdisciplinarity under one disciplinary roof, right, and kind of uh, you know use a, use an, a number of methods to kind of uh, to work in that in that particular type of way so um, so it was in some ways a continuation of what I was doing before um, in the sense that um, you know I, I like to kind of draw on a number of different types of knowledges and resources to to come at answers to questions that I'm interested in mm, I'm wondering then if you might be able to flesh out a little bit uh, what those met methodologies are that you use. So, and also implicit within that question is how you would define anthropology more broadly, whether it's a theoretical framework or whether it's a set of practices or I mean, how you use certainly, it. I mean, certainly I think um, for most of us, uh, you know, ethnography um, and cultural anthropology, at least anyway, um, ethnography and participant observation and those types of methods, right, um, are, are sort of emblematic of the discipline. Um, but again, drawing on Whatever, whatever other types of resources that you might and, and research practices that you might need in order to come at a better understanding of what you're looking at through participant observation. So if you need to do archival work, if you need to do, um, if you need to do interviewing, if you need to do, you know, all of these different types of things, um, I think are, for me, um, you, you, the project itself and the sets of, and the types of answers that you're looking for. Um, sort of determines the methods, the specific mm -hmm. methods or the specific sets of methods that I think that, um, that one might employ. Um, I know in my own work, um, I was, uh, I ended up studying um, as the Black Lives Matter movement started to emerge. Um, and I started to consider that as a research project. Uh, for me, a lot of the specific practices that, uh, that I needed to employ were di just, dictated by the circumstances. So for example, um, observing protests, right, and, um, and the importance of social media um, in organizing the protests and disseminating information about the protests and, and whatnot. Um, I hadn't thought about doing digital ethnography before, but I felt that I had to um, in order to do this project well, um, because that's where a lot of the that's where a lot of the activity was happening, right? Um, and so, uh, so, so I think in some ways, um, one of the things that anthropology does permit within that flexibility, right, is is the ability to is the excuse me the ability to adapt. Right um, to whatever it is that your 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 particular field site and, and the um, the circumstances and the needs and the possibilities within your field site might offer to you and so you can say you know surveys aren't going to really work here <laughs> perhaps right mm. but maybe I need to figure out how to use Twitter and how to interpret what I'm seeing on Twitter right um, and so uh, so yeah so it's it's so having that flexibility but I think um, what is distinguishing about anthropology as a whole is this sense of um, this mission and this purpose of of doing research that goes deep 
right, and uh, and kind of being able to understand that you have to uh, figure out the best way to get underneath the surface, right, and to and to paint a, a picture that's complex and and dynamic, um, and 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 not quite as flattened as you know maybe you might get from strict adherence to one set of methods in every set of circumstances, even if that set of methods isn't particularly useful mm. for where you're working. Absolutely. Well, maybe this would be a good point at which to focus in a little more detail on the work that you've been doing on the Black Lives Matter movement. So maybe if we could start, if you could just describe what the movement is for folks who are not so familiar with okay. it, and then talk about the angle that you've been approaching the movement from. Okay, so yeah, so, um, so essentially what we're now calling the Black Lives Matter movement is, um, is an organized, uh, now international um, movement against state violence um, against black people in the, it started in the US, right? Um, so the hashtag, it started as a hashtag, the name comes from a hashtag um, created by activists um, after the death of Trayvon, uh, uh, sorry, after the acquittal of George Zimmerman for the murder of Trayvon Martin. Okay. Um, when that verdict was released, um, the activist who founded Black Lives Matter, the or there's an organization that carries the name, but the movement, of course, it's a social movement, so it's broader than one organization. But this is the, this is the organization that gives its name to the movement. Um, the activists who founded that, uh, founded that organization are the ones who, in who coined the hashtag, right? Um, but it, it's, a, it's a movement that um, has grown out of um, the long history. I mean, the history of police violence against African Americans and, and people of color in the U.S. is not new. It didn't start in 2013, right? It's a very, it's a very old, um, it's a very old problem, um, and it's been, it's been subject. It's been a part of previous social movements, right? Um, the Black Panthers is an organization um, that was um, a, that was a you know, that arose in the in the 1960s, you know, um, and part of their a large part of their platform was dealing with the issue of state violence, right? And it goes back even further than that. So, however, so in 2013, um, this hashtag became prominently used. Um, and has been used as a rallying cry, a slogan, and an organizing um, principle in both digital and physical space, right, to organize on the street protest and, and other types of actions uh, that, drew, that draw attention to the reality and the ongoing, uh, ongoing problem of police and vigilante violence against black people in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and the movement ha also has grown out. There are chapters and, of you know, Black Lives Matter and people use it in different parts of the world, but it started in the U.S. and has kind of grown outward from there. Um, and so my particular interest in the movement, um, I have been working along the Northeast, right? So uh, roughly from New York City to Baltimore, or maybe New York City to D.C., um, traveling up and down that, that, that Northeast corridor, um, you know, observing protests that have been happening in different places, but also uh, going into communities, act, uh, organizing spaces, um, you know, religious uh, houses, like wherever people are gathering and kind of, uh, kind of organizing, mobilizing, discussing, doing other things. Um, my so within that geographic area, I focus most intensely on Black Muslim communities um, and how uh, how religious activism. Um, within the Islamic tradition uh, is, is manifesting in this particular moment of general racial crisis mm. in the U.S. Um, my, uh, my, my, uh, my questions are around uh, broadly thinking about how racial and religious identities intersect, right, to, and how, they, how, they, how they're embodied and how, um, how even religious practice, right, um, can be a form of protest. So I spend a lot of time in mosques as well, mm -hmm. um, looking at, for example, you know, the ways that, that religious sermons, right, address the issues of state violence and anti-black racism and Islamophobia, right? Because these are communities that are um, targeted in the current political climate in the U.S., both by anti-black racism and Islamophobia, right? That's kind of prominent in the public sphere, mm -hmm. um, particularly with the election results, right? And the election cycle that's led up to the results that we saw a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, so that's essentially the work that I do, right? I'm focusing on a particular 
a particular ident identity community, right, within the larger movement. The social movements, of course, are very broad, and they consist of a wide array of players, right? Um, and you know, and so just thinking about um, part of what I'm trying to deconstruct is not only um, the specific concerns of my research subjects or the communities that I'm focusing most closely on, um, but also thinking about how. How, how, we, how we talk about and analyze and consider what a social movement consists of, right? Because mm. um, there are a lot of moving parts, um, you know. And I think, so if we think about uh, like the civil rights movement, for example, like when we talk about it and think about it conceptually, you know, in retrospect, in history, it's, it's like this one thing, it's like Martin Luther King and you know, and it's, but it's, it was so much more complicated than that, right? There's so many different players and they, they bring something different. And so it's really, you know, in the spirit of anthropological inquiry, right? Really trying to go deep and right, really trying to go, uh, to go nuanced in terms of how we, um, how we're watching and how, how we're thinking about the events that are unfolding in front of us. Mm. And speaking of the ways in which things are often more complex than how they're presented publicly, I believe that a big part of your work is to take the things that you're learning and the sorts of stories that you're gathering into the public sphere mm -hmm. through a variety of different platforms. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how um, yeah, bringing parts of this movement that may be less well known into the public also constitutes a part of your work. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I've, uh, I think just my back, I, I don't know, I'm an activist, right, turned academic, right? So I have a lot of um, experience in the communities that I work with um, prior to, uh, to graduate school. Um, and so I think that my orientation to information and, and knowledge, right, um, is always uh, undertaken with those communities in mind and thinking about how um, academic knowledge is not particularly useful if just a few people read it, right? How do we take this knowledge and, and uh, all of this effort that we've invested into, into coming up with these complex and, and rich and hopefully useful answers if we don't share them with a variety of publics, right? How do, mm. how do we, um, and ethically, right? You know, as an anthropologist, my, the people who agree to work with me, agree to talk with me, um, agree to share their stories with me, to let me into their spaces, to let me into their homes, um, to give me information, all of the things that they, to feed me when I'm in the field, right? Mm. All of the things that they do, um, they don't have to. And so what I, what I do needs to be, um, needs to give something to them. It needs to do something for them as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of what, um, and, and the issues that I work on specifically are, I mean, they're life and death issues for people, right? It's not, there's, there's no way to kind of think about um, people getting shot by police officers in a theoretical way. Mm. Right? This is, this is, it's not, so for me, like, um, I always feel, and these, are, and these are issues that impact me personally, right? So I'm not in that way separate from the research that I do. Mm. Um, I, you know, I've grown up watching friends and neighbors brutalized by police. Um, so it's, it's, there's, so that issue of, of kind of, this is over here behind some ivory tower wall and this is something else, it's, not, it's just something that conceptually is alien to me. Um, so what I've tried to do in my work um, is to, uh, is to get, the, you know, they get, the research out to as broad an audience as possible. So I might write blog posts, I might write op-eds. Um, I, um, of course, I do academic publishing as well, um, but also um, television, radio, uh, whatever opportunities are, are possible and, and, and useful mm. for, for the work of it, for advancing the knowledge that hopefully will save people's lives. Mm. That's, that's for me, that's what's at stake here. Um, is what I is what I will pursue. So I've done a variety of, of, of things to kind of get that information out there, uh, and and so that's yeah, and so that's where that comes from. It's just it's really, um, and I think that uh, particularly for anthropologists who work on these types of critical issues, right? Ethically, we have an obligation, mm -hmm. right, to. Uh, to use the, to not keep that knowledge to ourselves, right? Mm. It's not it's not about 
I mean, you know, it's nice if we can make a living doing this, right, so that we can sustain ourselves and do the work, right, but, um, you know, but, but people's lives are actually at stake, right? Mm. Um, and, I, and I also, I think, um, as an anthropologist of color, um, I draw upon the long tradition of, of other social scientists and, and I mean, anthropologists and sociologists and, and uh, black researchers in other fields who have always, this, I mean, this is a tradition, right? right? So people like W.E.B. Du Bois who did scholarly sociological work in order to, um, in, in the service of, of black liberation, right? Zora Neale Hurston, um, St. Clair Drake, right? There are so many, pioneering black anthropologists and other social scientists who, for whom this distinction of activist and academic just didn't exist, right? Their, their scholarship was in the service of activism. And so for me, that's, uh, that's, how, I orient, that's how I orient myself um, mm. towards the work that I do, um, trying to follow that particular model. Mm. That's so well put. Um, I was just wanting to pick up on something that you mentioned Earlier, you talked about the importance of bringing stories that are deeper and more complex into the public. And with all of the public engagement that you've been doing, I'm just curious as to whether you've seen that taking effect in terms of being able to shift the discourse around how these sorts of movements are spoken about or who's included in how they're described. I think that, I, I mean, I think there's impact. I mean, I'm certainly, I, I wouldn't make any grand claims to changing the world all by myself. <laughs> However, um, I think that there are, I think there are a number of other uh, uh, scholars and public intellectuals that are out there, and activists as well, that are out there um, pushing the envelope further um, in, in ways that complicate the narratives. And even, even uh, frankly, the, the existence of social media allows for a lot of that, like it allows for a lot uh, a lot more multiplicity of stories. It, it allows for a lot. Um, uh, the, there's a potential for for narratives that might not get picked up by mainstream mm -hmm. news media uh, to be to, to to make their way out there anyway, right? And so um, so I think that there's a groundswell, right? You know, in part due to uh, emerging technologies in part due to, you know, um, to intentional work on the part of, uh, you know, a new generation of ac academics, whatever, right? You know, I think that um, for, through a, conf a confluence of a number of different things, I think we are beginning to push the needle, at least in terms of what's possible, in terms of, in terms of which types of voices at least have the potential um, to, um, to, to reach a broader audience and then to have some sort of impact in the world. Um, so certainly um, the example of, of what we're now calling Black Lives Matter as a movement itself, right, um, largely owes right, its, its, uh, its spread, right, and, and, its, and the, the, um, the momentum that it's picked up uh, over the last couple of years, right, due to the fact that there are people from different, you know, different quarters, people who are activists, people who are academic, academics, people who are both uh, or neither, um, continuously, right, pushing a different type of narrative, a, diff a more complex narrative, okay? If there's a story, so I um, was in Baltimore last year um, when, uh, when the unrest, when, when the Baltimore uprising, when Freddie Gray, uh, Freddie Gray was a young African-American Baltimore resident who was killed by, by police in that city. Um, and in the week, week or so following um, his, uh, his, uh, his death, um, there was unrest in the city between police and, and residents. And I was, happened to be there um, when it happened. Um, but one of the things that, I mean, and so of course, this was covered, this story was covered by media from all over the world. I mean, there were, there were Russian newspapers on, <laughs> I mean, you know, like with cameras. And so there, were, there was a ton of, you know, traditional media there, right? Um, and it was interesting for me as an anthropologist on the ground, you know, and then I'd go home at night and, or, and then I'd watch, you know, CNN or, you know, cover events that I was just present at. You know, and so there's a really interesting kind of disconnect <laughs> between what I was watching on TV and what I just left. Um, and but what was what was what was also uh, encouraging in that moment was that I could also look at my Twitter feed and I could see that there were 
yeah, that those those minutia, those stories that um, that maybe I had noticed, or other people who were like at ground level and not really like working with that kind of you know lens, like a camera in my hand, and I have a story to tell, and I have a deadline, and I have an editor, and I have to you know, but just being able to kind of say like I snapped this picture of these neighbors. Uh, holding a barbecue for the neighborhood, like in the aftermath of, of all of the difficulty that people just experience and handing out free food, right? You know, those types of things, you know, didn't generally get picked up, right, mm -hmm. by broad, by larger media outlets, right? But that's still an important story to tell, right? Uh, so I think that um, the, there's a confluence of a number of different uh, you know, technologies and whatnot that, that, that are enabling. I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done. I mean, we're still having to, um, having to deal with flattened, uh, simplistic, um, you know, narratives that generally serve as blunt tools with which to analyze extremely complicated situations in ways that do damage to people who are vulnerable. Mm. Um, you know, so we still have a lot of work to do, but I'm hopeful that, you know, we do have at least, uh, the po there's at least a possibility, right, that, that mm. some of this might begin to change. Mm. I'm really glad that you mentioned the kind of disconnect between your experience of observing and being part of a movement as an anthropologist, but also as an activist and just mm. as a person who's there, uh, versus the kind of news platforms that are picking up on the same movement, because that's a conversation that's come up at times during this course is, well, what then is the difference between anthropology and journalism mm -hmm. in some aspects, right? Like some people might be able to see it as a, as a long-term, you know, mm -hmm. deeper form of journalism. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you could flesh out whether you think that there's something, whether or not you think that there's still something that sets anthropology apart. And then also the fact that um, Anthropology, particularly anthropology of social movements that can move quite quickly and do have mm -hmm. a sense of urgency behind them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that anthropology being a kind of longer form um, way of engaging with these movements can respond in a way that's timely enough? Or do you think it, at times it can, you know, yeah. do a little too much analyzing or be too slow? Or is that a risk, I suppose? Well, oh, so, so f as far as the first question is concerned, which was like related to um, the differences between anthropology and journalism, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think that like, without being too like, you know, sweeping, because um, there are journalists, I think still, you know, maybe they're not as many, or maybe it's the opportunities are, are less, but I think there are still journalists that do fairly, at least slow for journalism and, and rather thoughtful work, right? You know, with trying to really like, go in and ask some really deep and probing questions. And the timelines are different, but I think, um, you know, I think there are still, um, there are still possibilities within the field of journal journalism for that type of rich, complex storytelling. Um, now, whether it materializes as often as it should is maybe another question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I don't think that because someone is in a place doing research or participant observation or whatever for a long period of time necessarily means that they will produce analyses that are any more rich and nuanced. I mean, mm. length of time is one thing, right? Um, but I think what's more important, whether you're a journalist or an anthropologist, is this commitment to telling a complex story. And so you do the best with whatever the constraints are that you have. But if you have a commitment to that as a project, I think your work will reflect that. Um, and if not, it won't. It doesn't matter how long you stay there. Mm. Um, if, uh, and, and, and the second question was more about like, um, I'm sorry, can you remind me what the second yeah, question was? Yeah, of course, just about the timeliness. The timeliness. That, that's, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think for me, like, I, I had to actually, there were things that I learned in my anthropology methods class, for example, um, about how one generally does field work um, that turned out to be not particularly applicable to the type of research and, and the subject material that I was mm. looking at. Like, I wasn't settling into a place. I was, I mean, I, you know, I, I worked, for, I mean, I work, I live in New Jersey, so I was home-based, but I had to have the flexibility to get up and drive to Baltimore. I mean, when I went to Baltimore, I went to Baltimore basically on two-day notice, you know, and I, when I got there, um, you know, because I, I, I saw on social media, for example, that Freddie Gray had been, I had never intended to work in Baltimore. Mm. Wasn't on my radar. Um, 
I, I saw that he was killed and I saw that there were like kind of daily protests after his death. And I, and I said to myself, this looks interesting. I should go there. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a three hour drive, three and a half hours. Um, so I got up and I drove, mm -hmm. intending to stay for a day or two. Um, and you know, things kind of exploded while I was there. And so I had to make arrangements to, you know, I had to, you know, so it was like on the fly, I had to figure out how to stay there and cover it. I couldn't get up and leave now because there's obviously something really huge happening here. Um, I didn't even have enough clothes to last me for, you know, I packed for, I packed for a weekend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it was just so, so I, so that, that sense of, or, you know, at least how, how some, uh, previous generations of anthropologists um, may have learned how to do field work in a relatively settled geographical type of situation. Um, I mean, I, I might be in New York today, I might be in Philadelphia tomorrow, you know, I mean, I had to be nimble, mm. like physically, I had to, you know, I had to move a lot. Um, and sometimes at a moment's notice, because a protest might crop up, you know, something happens, there's a, you know, there's a news announcement that this person was shot or killed or, um, uh, this officer is not going to be indicted for shooting and killing someone. Mm. And so then there's a protest in two hours, mm. right? So, okay, <laughs> I got, you know, so as much as I could, at least anyway, um, you know, I, I had to move with the movement. I had to move with where, where, where the happenings were um, and adjust. And, and I, think I, I think we can do that type of work, um, but there has to be, I think, I think we we have the disciplinary tools, right, which give us enough flexibility, right, conceptually, to mm -hmm. be open to doing that type of work, right, um, to to thinking about like how um, how I might actually document this, right. You know, I'm clearly not going to be writing in a notebook, mm -hmm. right, um, field notes while I'm, you know, while I'm following a protest down, you know. Times Square, mm. right? But um, but I took tons of pictures, tons of video, um, collected tweets, right, from people who are also at the march, and we use those as you know, like so. I, so I had to really figure out um, how to come up with a, or you know to utilize a set of 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 tools that would allow me to kind of you know collect data and explore things and, and be there and be present, right, um, in ways that were drastically different, no, in some ways drastically different from the training that I had received in the classroom mm. um, who, who, by people who had done anthropology in different parts of the world and, you know, maybe 30 years ago. Um, so just thinking about the fact that I think anthropology can accommodate all of those things, right, but I think we have to, um, we have to, as a discipline, how we teach people how to do anthropology, like what it means, okay, it's, I think it's not necessarily this list of methods, right? You do this practice, you, you know, like whatever. It's more about how, how do we, what sets of practices, right, will enable us to get the type of information and to tell the type of stories that we need to tell, right? Mm. Which means that might be different from my field site and someone else's. Mm. Um, you know, and it, and and we do need to be um, be willing to update, right? Um, think about, and I think there, I mean I know there are anthropologists that are talking about this and thinking about this. Um, you know, when new technologies emerge, what do they enable, right? And thinking critically about what um, what that allows and what um, what what the possibilities are. Um, I mean, I in addition to pictures, I would take sound recordings of mm. just ambient noise where I was, you know, just, um, you know, on my phone. And it was great because my smartphone actually enabled me to do all of these things, right, just with with, fair, with a fair amount of ease, right? So so thinking about what's, you know, okay, what, what does the invention of a smartphone do for how we work in the field, right? And I think sometimes, um, or even how, um, you know, I, because I ended up taking I ended up relying on photography a lot and during the course of my field work I, I, at some point. I'm not a photographer at all. Um, and I was thinking, okay, you know, maybe I, sh I, maybe I should actually invest in a real camera, real camera. <laughs> and like, you know, and, and, then I, 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 and then I realized that actually 
because I was working in areas where there's a lot of media, I actually thought about like where people have sometimes a complicated media uh, relationship with like established news media outlets. Like I look less intimidating or less suspicious or less weird, right, if I am just carrying my phone camera, mm. right? And so how even people perceive me and are willing to, uh, willing to talk to me and the types of stories that, you know. So, so, so the, the tools that we use, the actual tools, right, the material technology tools that we use to write, record, whatever, um, actually, have different outcomes and different uh, different possibilities, and so thinking about um, all of those things, I think, are important as we teach future generations of anthropologists how to go out into the field and do the things that they do. I think um, j just a commitment to to understanding your context and what works best for your context, right? And you might have some trial and error, right? You mm. may not know that ahead of time, right? But um, but I think if we're um, if we're, if we're teaching anthropologists to be flexible, um, then, uh, then they, will do, they will figure out what it is they need to do, whether they're studying something that's slow moving or, or more quickly moving, mm. right? So I, th I think anthropologists are, are, can be great. I mean, I've had um, some really rich, uh, it, it, you know, um, some of them are difficult, but I mean, some really rich experiences like trying to follow a social movement. And, mm. um, and I think, um, and I think it's important for anthropologists, it's essential for anthropologists to be there, um, to begin to tell these types of complicated stories, right? But that means that we're gonna have to like let go of some of, you know, I mean, and I don't, you know, maybe what I was taught, it, you know, or some of the, some of the uh, th ways that I learned how to do and how to be in the field and what, or what to expect from the field mm -hmm. is not necessarily representative of what people are taught in other places. Um, but I think that, uh, I, th I think it's, it's probably safe to say that um, we're not always, uh, we haven't always caught up with the realities of the, the phenomenon that we wanna study, like mm -hmm. logistically, right, in terms of how we're teaching people to do it. So I think if we can kinda adjust a little bit um, the way we train mm -hmm. um, and, what, and what we, um, what we, t what we uh, the expectations, right, of what the, what the field can be. Mm. Um, I think we can do what we need to do. Mm. It's such important work that you're doing and such good points that you've made. So thank you so much thank for joining us Thank you so much for, for inviting me here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.